Lakeland Public Television presents Currents. Hello, welcome to Lakeland Currents. I'm Bethany Wesley. In August, Minnesota Governor Mark Dayton announced that 74 school districts and charter schools would benefit from $25 million in new state funding, allowing more than 3,300 four-year-olds to attend voluntary pre-kindergarten programs free of charge. The expansion of the state's pre-kindergarten funding aims to prepare Minnesota's youngest learners for academic success. More than 180 school districts and charter schools applied for funds, but 60% did not receive the state aid. According to Dayton's office, had all the requests been funded, more than 10,000 children in 183 districts and charter schools would have been enrolled in pre-K programs this year. Tonight, however, we focus on one of the programs that is benefiting from the increased funding. Nevis Public Schools was one of the successful applicants, having been allocated more than $142,000 for around 70 students. While it's too early to discuss the impact of the state funding on the Nevis program itself, having had it for only a few months now, we welcome this chance to highlight the Nevis Early Childhood Education Program, its class offerings, and its staff. And so I welcome to the program tonight Abby Henry, the Early Childhood Coordinator, who also teaches the four-year-old Kindergarten Preparedness Program, and Jen McNamee, who teaches the three-year-old School Readiness Program. Welcome to the program. Thanks for coming up. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. As we get started, let's just do some introductions first. Talk a little bit about how long you've been teaching and how long you've been in Nevis. Abby? I've been at Nevis for seven years now. This is my seventh year. And now before Nevis, you were in other places as yes, well, correct? Yes, I a few other settings where I worked as well. Okay. And Jen, you started around basically the same time yes, in Nevis. Yes, I've been in Nevis for seven years as well. And prior to that, you had career elsewhere. Yes. Let's talk about the programs themselves, because there's two, two separate programs. Abby, let's, uh, let's start with Jen's first, since yours is the younger one. I have three and four-year-olds. Okay. Children start in my class when they're 33 months, and some of them are four-year-olds mm -hmm. as well when they're starting my program. So. And how frequently does that class meet? We meet um, two days a week. Okay. I have two different groups. One meets on Monday and Wednesday, one meets on Tuesday and Thursday, and we meet from 8.30 to 11.30. Okay, so they're half-day programs. Half-day programs, okay. yes. And Abby, your program? My program is a full day program. I also have two groups of 20 students in each class and they are four to five year olds getting ready most likely to transition to kindergarten. Okay. So are they structured similar, obviously different ages, different time frames, but are they structured similarly? Are they different? How do they, do they have different emphases? Um, I would say yes. I mean, mine are geared down a level from what Abby does. Sure. Um, my classroom gets the kids ready for Abby's okay. class transition. So fair to say that as they grow, assuming that they start mm -hmm. in the three-year-old and continue on, yep. yours is more challenging than they are when they first get started. Mm -hmm. And now in addition, we do want to touch on, in addition to yourselves in the classroom, you also have additional teaching assistants and other adults who are there as well, correct? So do you, what are, give or take, you know, roughly the staff to kid ratio? I mean, is it usually? The preschool ratio is is 10 to 1. Okay. So I have one classroom aid in the classroom all day with me. Okay. Let's talk about a typical day, like how the kids get started. Um, and so I know that they're kind of arranged similarly, but let's start with your class first. What is a typical day for your kids? Um, my kids come in and uh, have breakfast in the morning if they haven't eaten at home. And then we have playtime, social time, and then we also do some one-on-one -on -one skills, we pull the kids out and do some one-on-one -on -one okay. time. And then uh, we have our uh, circle time where we discuss calendar and do some skills and get ready for our centers, and which are based on usually a letter and a theme um, for the week that we're working on. And then we have five different centers that we do. Um, one is a skill center, usually based on the letter that we're working on, a sensory and a gross motor a fine motor, a dramatic play area, and then usually an arts and crafts center. So they get used to that schedule, yes. right? The schedule yes. is very consistent. Yes. Is that helpful for younger kids yes. to know what's coming up? Yes. They thrive on structure. <laughs> is it similarly structured for your kids as well? Obviously you have a fuller day, but mm -hmm. do you have the same schedule kind of throughout the day? Yep. My morning time, um, they come in and have breakfast as well. Um, it's, it's a good transition um, just to get them comfortable into the classroom. 
um, each day starts out brand new, mm -hmm. so um, it's a good time to give them comfort in the classroom. And then we also transition into our, our learning centers and we focus on letters and, and, and fine motor skills and large motor skills as well. Um, the play, the communication, and, and those kinds of things that we do in our centers. And our day continues, continues on with lunch and, and um, outside time and play time and rest time and things like that. Do you find that you can get further as the year goes on, like those first few weeks? I mean, I'm assuming just circle can take up almost your entire day. I mean, do you find that as they get more used to the routine that you incorporate more? Yes, I, I, we were discussing that on our way down this morning and how much just in the last couple of weeks we've seen growth in the children just socially and being more comfortable in the classroom and emotionally being comfortable with us as teachers and with their peers. And going back to routine, routine is safe for them. So they, they feel really comfortable in the classroom by now. So we can really start to really um, engage them and, and move on with some of those skills that they, they can mm -hmm. prosper from. Mm -hmm. As they get comfortable with the schedule and the routines, do you find that then you can kind of, <coughs> they challenge themselves to kind of break out of their own shells and mm -hmm. learn more, yes. you know, socially? Yes. 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 I want to talk about early childhood education just kind of generally for a second. Is it, would you say the focus is academic? Is it social? Is it emotional? Is it all of those things all together? Is it different at your level versus the kids that are in your class? It's all of those things. Um, I think for mine, being just three, it's f for the families too, it's an adjustment. It's f the parents are sending their three-year-olds off to school for the first time. And so, you know, it's, it's difficult for them and for these children, it's the first time that they've left their parents if they don't go to daycare on a regular basis. And so for some of them, it can be quite an adjustment. And um, it's an awesome opportunity for them to be able to branch out socially, emotionally, and academically. Okay. And then you build on that. I build on that, yep. And, and the social and emotional portion of that is, is really critical, I think, in these early years um, with how education has pushed down a little more. So it, it's good for them to have school routine and structure so when they get into the academic portion of their day, they can be able to focus and, and stay on task. We should say, you, the, the kids that are in your program, the four and five year olds, are not necessarily required to have gone through Jen's program, correct? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so you've seen some kids that come straight from wherever, home or daycare, mm -hmm. and you've seen kids who have come through Jen's program. Mm -hmm. Can you tell the difference quickly? I mean, can you tell on that very, oh, you can. <laughs> yes. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> in terms like how, do, what is the difference? Like how can you tell? Just overall following the structure of the day. Um, oh, okay. Following someone else's routine, um, things like that, that they, um, need to adjust to. Mm -hmm. um, and we do get some that have had their first time ever being away from home and, and to meet that emotional adjustment as well. Is early childhood education more important now than perhaps it was a decade ago, two decades ago? Would you say that it, there's more of an emphasis on it than there was before? Yes. Because of what you were referencing earlier that perhaps education's more intense, younger than it used to be? Education is younger, you know, than it used to be, and I also think it has to do with our societal changes as well. Okay. Have you seen that parents really buy into that, or have there been times that you have parents that say, I don't know if we really need preschool? Like, how do you help parents kind of walk through that? Does that ever come up? I think, I know when I first conference with parents, they are amazed at all the different things that we work on with the academic skills, the fine motor skills, just sitting down and having snack and what our expectations are, um, their self-help skills. I mean, there's a lot that goes on in the classroom and for their first time, they're, you know, for some of them, and it's their first child coming in and are, so the expectations for them, they're, they're surprised at what we require of them to do. I want to talk a little bit specifically about those individual stations so people kind of just get a better idea as to how they're different. And so I think the day that I was visiting most recently was for you doing a lesson on bears. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And so you read a book about bears mm -hmm. and then each station was 
set up to kind of focus on a different skill but still kind of reflect that general idea. Maybe you could walk us through the stations? Would that be? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Trying to remember. <laughs> Um, one of the centers we were working on was patterning, and um, that was our skill for the day. Um, our sensory table had a flower kind of um, building consistency where okay. they can make caves. It had animals in there, and they were building caves for the animals. Um, at our arts and crafts center, they were making bears and putting the pieces together to make the face, the ears. Um, and then we had a bear cave in the classroom and the children were reading books in, in there and dramatic playing with the bear. And then our last center um, was our gross motor center where there were animal tracks throughout the classroom of different animals that hibernate and migrate and adapt to the winter. And um, the children had to crawl like bears, fly like geese, run like a deer and hop like a rabbit. So we practiced those gross motor skills as well. So they're all at these different stations simultaneously, right? Yes. And so you have smaller groups. Yes. Does it, when you break into smaller groups in your classrooms, does that help you and your teaching assistants kind of help kids more individually than you can in a big group? Yes, yes. We can focus on, on different skills, needs in areas where they, they need more. And the centers themselves, they're learning independence. They're learning communication skills. They're learning those language skills, um, the gross motor they're learning how to, to manage those things on their own with adult supervision, so we're able to step in if we need to. Mm -hmm. But they also are developing then more of that independent, yes. independent learning mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. And I'm assuming that's also when you can kind of work on some of your testing and evaluations mm -hmm. yes. without necessarily doing it too publicly. Mm -hmm. I want to talk a little bit about um, when you can help a kid earlier like if you find, I'm assuming that when you have kids who are younger and you're working with them daily, that you can probably identify some kids who might need some ex extra attention or extra help as the school year goes on. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Yes. And is it easier from what you've seen to help a kid when they're younger versus later in their educational career? Yes. How does that work then in your, in your programs? When you have a kid that you say, you know what, this, this child might just need a little bit more attention or a little bit extra assistance? Um, well, the, all the children have to be screened. Okay. And so when we screen the children, that um, helps us to know, okay, we're seeing some issues here. Then we can go ahead, especially if they don't pass the screen, and go ahead and start with the testing. Okay. Um, and then Abby and I will discuss with our special ed, early childhood special okay. ed teacher. Because you guys have a dedicated early childhood special education teacher, right? Yes. And so she's working with you guys pretty constantly. Mm -hmm. I mean, you guys are a pretty firm teaching team. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. And so does she work in the classroom or out of the classroom? Or how does she work with the kids she who might? She does a little bit of both. Okay. She will um, work in the classroom. Or if there's anything more specific or more intense that needs to be done, she, she will pull them out. And what's nice about her is she works through first grade, so she's able to follow them. Um, follow them on as they get into the school setting and continue to meet some of those needs early on. So as they transition the kid from early childhood to K and beyond, at least they have that familiar face yes. who kind of is there to yes. help them. Yes. Oh, that's great. Um, I want to talk some more too about uh, some of the other things you guys do. I know that when weather cooperates, you guys do have playtime outside and mm -hmm. you can get there, but it's more, there's more involved than just the actual playtime. What is it that kids are learning as they prepare to go outside and I mean are they kind of is, it's a learning process mm -hmm. yes can yeah. you speak a little bit to that yeah they're they're learning their independent skills they're learning to do things on their own they're learning to zip their coats put on their snow pants and boots all on their own um, they're learning to to um, keep track of their own <laughs> items as well <laughs> and is it for some of them, is it the first time they've done that? I mean, have, in a lot of cases, mm -hmm. moms and dads have done those yes. for them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I bet you hear a lot from parents, the growth that they see from their kids from fall to spring. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Did you see that when you were having conferences recently, like yes. even in the first half of the year? Yes. That is one of the things that is on my assessment <laughs> is that they're able to put their coats on by themselves. And until, you know, parents see that, they don't realize that that's what is expected of them. So. I know we talked a little bit about um, parents and kind of their response to preschool, but do you feel like the community as a whole has really supported your program? 
Um, do you feel like the community supports, you know, the expansion of the program? And, you know, I know that you guys have a fairly new facility, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's just a few years old? Yes. And that was, was that with bond money? Was that a referendum that helped produce that? And a grant okay. that was written. And so your facility is now a dedicated part of the school, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And so it, it's an easy drop off for parents. How important is it that you have this facility and with the amenities that came with it? Has, did that help the program blossom? Do you know what I'm saying? Like have there been features of that new facility that help you out? Yes. Such as? Um, just the ease of I mean, before we had to walk the kids from the buses over to our old facility, which was a walk. Yeah. yeah, it was a safety walking through a parking lot. And now parents can just drop them off, come right in at the front door. We have the roundabout there where parents can pull in and drop them off. And it's, it's much easier. Okay. And now I know that in your rooms, you also have restrooms. You have certain amenities closer, which mm -hmm. has to make it easier for the kids. Yes. Much. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you also have like smart board. Do you ever use that with the kids? Often. In which, way, which yeah. How do you use a smart board with little kids? Um, I, I use it. I have a curriculum that I use through, through it. And it's interactive, so they can interact with it as well. Um, any kind of music, large motor, things like that, that they can follow along with, they love to do. Um, there's there's all sorts of things that you can use your smart board for. Does it help to have those kind of different things to keep their interest? Mm -hmm. I know they get used to their routine, but they must like it when it's something new and flashy. Yes. Yeah, yes. And, and we can build our, our smart board into our routine as well so they know when is smart board time and, and things like that. So it's, it's fun. They really enjoy it. Um, tell me about when you see the kid. Like, what is your favorite part of teaching throughout the day? Like, do you do you like the small time? Do you like the big times? Do you, do you like all of them? I enjoy all of them. The one-on-one -on -one time with the kids, but yet the large group, they're sharing. Um, it's, it's always, you never know what's going to come out of their mouths. It's very entertaining. <laughs> you two work in tandem. I mean, I know you guys have your separate programs, but you work in tandem. How do you go about planning for the school year together, like to make sure the programs are you know, aligned well to make sure that, you know, what they're learning here helps them in, in your program. How do you work together in that, those ways? Well, we started a professional learning community with the kindergarten teachers as well. So we are once a month talking about um, the needs, what we see, what we think that needs to be done. We are always communicating, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what we think would help each other out. Okay. And each year, you know, it varies depending on the kids. And so we adjust curriculums adjust what we do skills based on the kids that are coming in as well do you have some years where you have kids that seem to be you know kind of up here mm -hmm. and other years when maybe you know yes. they're just not quite as ready mm -hmm. and you do you know that before that first day or do you kind of have to figure that out as you go you figure it out as you go <laughs> we talked a little bit about how you can tell which kids have gone through Jen's program do you hear similar things from kindergarten teachers and beyond that they can tell which kids have been through preschool? Yes, yes, yes. And from what you've heard, does it seem to benefit them beyond those first couple years of elementary? Like, is there any way to know? I think the biggest benefit that we, we've heard and known is, is the structure and being able to follow the routine of a day. Okay. Um, you know, these little ones, they, they catch on quickly and they mm -hmm. learn quickly. So um, I think it just, just falls back on that routine and, and knowing how to, to function in the classroom, I think, has been the biggest, the biggest point made. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's great um, that we're now a part of the actual school. <clears throat> and so coming into the elementary school for the first time as a kindergartner isn't as overwhelming for them because they've been in the school before and they're familiar with um, the building, with the teachers, and there are a lot of familiar faces for them. So it isn't as overwhelming for them. They're comfortable. Yes. So I'm sure that first day of kindergarten is a little less in. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's nerves, but it's a little less intense than perhaps it could be otherwise. Yes. Um, we've heard, you know, that kindergarten is kind of the new first grade, preschool is kind of the new kindergarten. Do you guys teach the kids to read at your level, or are you just kind of setting foundations for that, or what is it that they're expected to know by the end of the year? Um, I, I, I tell parents at my conferences, all the things we do don't have to be mastered by the end of by the end of preschool. It's just experiences in it and um, 
like I said, they if they catch on, they catch on, but it's all things that they review in kindergarten as well. Okay. And it's just it just gives them that extra step into um, the familiarity and the comfort in kindergarten. Has there ever been times when with a parent you might be talking about next steps for a kid, either in your program or your program, where you might suggest, you know what, I just don't think your child's quite ready for that next step? I mean, it's, the decision's ultimately left to the parent, but do you ever have those conversations where you're like, you know what, this kid might benefit from? Yes. Are they pretty receptive to that? Yes. Okay. Because everybody wants what's best for, mm -hmm. the, for the kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell me a little bit about um, how, do you, how often are you evaluating kids? And um, how often are you talking with parents? And then how, how strict is it in terms of evaluations to move forward? Do you know what I'm saying? How often do you evaluate kids? Let's start. Let's, let's we start. do. We do. Um, we ha our progress report is in the spring and the fall. Mm -hmm. okay. So we start with our fall one, um, which is about six weeks into school, and then our last one is in March. Yeah. Okay. And you can certainly document then the gains that each child yes. has made. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so is it just if you don't see a consistent gain, that might be when you might just talk to a parent mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. yes. their child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're continually assessing and, yes. and watching our children. Every day. Daylight, daylight. <laughs> yeah. I bet you've seen kids who have off days and they have yeah. good days. And yes. Mm -hmm. Kids certainly seem to enjoy being in school. I mean, do they like the challenge of school, yes. generally speaking? Yes. Cool. And then you've seen from the first day when they're super, I mean, I'm sure you've had kids who just drop off crying and then yes. by the end they're running inside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. How do the kids respond to you when they come back the next year? the kids that you've see, you haven't seen in a summer that maybe, I know they might be going to Abby's program, but they might see you. I mean, are they excited to be back? Yes, yes. they are. They are. Always a smile and a hug. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> when you go about setting up your stations, are you picking one giant topic? Like you were talking about the bears. I think you did a, a s different sections for pumpkins and mm -hmm. Halloween. Are you trying to tie it in to just reinforce that overall larger lesson? Yeah, I, the theme-based, I think, um, mm -hmm helps expand their vocabulary. Some, some kids aren't ex uh, exposed to um, different, different things like opening up a pumpkin and looking inside or even just learning about hibernation mm -hmm. or migration and things like that. So it really expands their vocabulary and, and experiences overall. I wanted to touch a little bit about the sensory table itself because for somebody who hasn't been in a preschool, it might be a a strange concept, the fact that you're giving people just different textures to play with. What, what is the purpose of it, or what, what's the benefit of a sensory table, or what do the kids get out of that? Well, a lot of it is it's play, but it's also the fine motor, and um, a lot of younger kids we're finding out have sensory needs, where they're very sensitive to different textures, different touches, um, and so it's an experience for them, a learning experience, not only with just the play, but also with the sensory and those fine motor skills. I mean, because you expect kids to be writing and to be, you know, to be doing certain things like that in a school setting, but when you see kids doing bear crawls around the, the room, it's hard to sometimes understand where that benefit is, but they're learning how to move their bodies and control their bodies. Mm -hmm. um, circle time, I know, I wanted to talk a little bit more specifically about circle time because there's so much involved in it. It's not just reading a book. Tell me about what you take the kids through every day so they know, because circle time really sets up the day, right? Mm -hmm. So what is it that they're learning at circle time that you got calendar and things like that? Can you walk us through that? Yeah, they're learning body awareness, um, how to sit in a group with others without being distracted and staying on task. Um, <clears throat> We do, we do name games, so they're learning the names of their friends. Um, um, any kind of finger play that focuses on counting, rhyming, um, numbers, um, and then calendar just focuses on all those math skills as well. So they start to get familiar, even if you know they're not learning all of the months in a row, they're starting to get familiar with the fact that there's generally 30 days in a month. Mm -hmm. And then they see how it progresses through the week. Mm -hmm. By the end of the year, <coughs> they really have that circle time down. I mean, they know what's coming up, how it's going. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they look forward, I'm sure, to finding out what those tables are, right? Because that's mm -hmm. really what the big unveiling yes. is, is what the activities are each yes. day. Yes. And now, how do you decide who goes to which table? Do they rotate every day or...? Yeah, they rotate, yep. we rotate them. And you have a schedule that they are announced to, I've seen that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
So tell me some about um, what made you guys want to be teaching these grades. What is it about this age that really appeals to you, that you enjoy the most? For me, choosing early childhood, it just came so naturally to me. I, I was a babysitter. I babysat kids when I was young. Um, I, I just, I don't know, there was something about it I just loved. And, and they're so eager to learn that it's, it's just fun to watch them grow so much mm -hmm. over the year. Yeah, and I've, I, I knew when I went to school that this is, I wanted to work with children. And um, this opportunity came up to work with preschoolers, and um, I've, I've just fallen in love with it. I, I love my job. We who don't teach have frequently heard from teachers about that moment the light goes on in the kids' mm -hmm. kids' eyes. In this age, do you see that repeatedly all the yes. time? I yes. Because yes. they're constantly <laughs> mastering a, yes. new, a new skill. Yes. They're very excited about their sponges. They take absolutely everything in. They appreciate everything that you do with them, and they're so excited to, to learn new things. Well, it sounds like you guys have really mastered the program and kind of gotten your program up, up and running and going well and going forward. What do you see in your, the future of your program? Do you see it possibly expanding, or is it pretty, pretty strong how it is now? I think we have a pretty strong program. Yes. Right now. Great. Well, I want to thank you guys for coming up and meeting with us today and letting me come and see your kids and see your facility and your classrooms. It was, the kids were having excitement and laughing and it was just fantastic to see. So thank you. Thank you for joining me today on this latest episode of Lakeland Currents. Please join me the next time.